Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day, this week, and that is Sabbath, and that we can rest in your presence. I ask that as we open up your word, that you will guide and direct, send the Holy Spirit to speak to me, and to give the message in which you would want to speak. Lord, let my voice not be heard, but let your voice be resounding throughout this place. Amen. I'd like to begin the study in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's easy to find the first book, first verse in the Bible. If you have found it, say amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. That verse sparks a lot of controversy. We're going to kind of talk about that. As you've already noticed, the title is Defending Genesis of this study. Before we can really talk about how to defend Genesis, we want to have like a brief overview or review of the context and what actually Genesis contains. If you read with me in verse 1, we see Creator God creating the heavens and the earth. If you read further, you will find that not only is it the heavens and the earth, but actual things that are being created, like microorganisms, plants, animals, things like that. But who is the creator? I'm sure all of you know who it is. God, or Jesus. And we find this reiterated in John, John chapter 1. So go with me there, if you will, to John chapter 1. By the way, all of this is in the bulletin if you want to go ahead and put your finger. John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Just say amen when you found it. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. In verse 3, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So this is actually referring to Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. Some people say, oh, well, God created Jesus. No, he was in the beginning. It's important to note that God, or Jesus, has pre-existed all of creation. He is not tied to it, to the fact that his existence depended on it. He pre-existed everything. So what exactly did Jesus create? Well, we find the first thing that he created was space and time. Space and time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he divided the days, the evening and the morning. So he created a space in which to do this, and then he created the time. We also find that he created the seven-day week. Where do we get the week? Well, we know that a year is astronomical. We go by 365.5 days. The Earth makes its rotation around the sun. We know that a day is astronomical because that's how long it takes the Earth to revolve on its own axis. And the month is actually kind of astronomical because they divided the month so that it would fit and squeeze in to make the year. But where did the leak come from? Well, we know that the leak came from creation. God created the seven-day leak. So that's an interesting thing to note because I looked that up, like, where did the leak come from? And I couldn't find anything except for Genesis. So the leak is found in Genesis. We also have life, consistence of plants, animals, people. We have sin on earth. God didn't create that, but we find that Genesis mentions the origin of sin on earth is in Genesis, in the garden. We have marriage. God created marriage. The Sabbath, or holy time. I love this. It's creation week. God created something, and then he filled it with something. And you, you find that pattern. God created the seventh day, and he filled it with himself. So that we can enjoy Him instead of, you know, well, we can enjoy nature. But God created the seventh day so that specifically it was filled with His presence. 
We also find the creation of culture. If you read on, you'll find like people gathering together and creating communities. And language, the power of Babel. And also the very, very first prophecy is actually mentioned in Genesis. We're all familiar with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So these are all the things, and I'm sure that you can think of many, many more things that we find in the book of Genesis. So these are all the contents. But how is it under attack? How? And I'm sure you all know one very, very obvious way, which is evolution. Very good. Evolution is probably the major way, but there's actually two ways in which um, Genesis is under attack. And they kind of correlate. But what's interesting is that there are two New Testament authors that actually predicted or prophesied that these two ways would come about and how they would. So God in his mercy has provided some sort of provision, if you please, to help us understand that this is what's going to happen and this is the result of that. So evolution is the main and most prominent theory. And actually the Big Bang Theory is still the gold standard today for our origins. And we're going to take just a brief look at that. So if you look right here, I know it's kind of fuzzy. This is the Big Bang, which kind of in scientific terms, it's kind of like a, they call it like a quantum fluctuation, where something just kind of happened out of nothing. And actually, that's kind of like what God did. He spoke and there it was. So if there was any kind of theory that I would come up with if I didn't believe in the Bible, it would kind of be like this too. So we have the Big Bang, which is like a quantum flux, which something kind of just rumbles and then pop, and then all of these things kind of come together and you have some sort of inflation. And there we have life after how many so years. So scientists say that the Earth is 13.7 billion years old. That's kind of the, the going theory. And nobody likes to fight with these scientists or kind of rebuttal what they say because they are geniuses in their own right. They go to the best universities. They profess or claim to be wise. And those that do, they might not have a lot of funding or a lack of support. You know, so these kinds of theories are the gold standard. And not only are they theories, but now they are stated as fact. If you read a textbook, it is not, this is what we believe. It is, this is fact. We know that the Earth is 13.7 billion years ago. And that's when it was created, or it came out of nothing. So, what is it really? Um, the reason, one of the ways that scientists come up with to get this old Earth theory is something called radiometric dating, which I'm sure some of you have heard of it. It's where you take a rock or a mineral and you study the rate of decay of an isotope. I'm not going to go into that. But you study the rate of decay of an isotope inside. And this is a really, really popular method called um, potassium argon dating, in which they find a mineral. It's got to be a mineral. And they, they measure the um, radioactive decay of the isotope potassium into argon. Now, scientists say that this method is absolute, no doubt. But is it? Is it, though? Well, sometimes when we hear these things, we don't really understand the complex subject matter, and so we're like, well, I don't know what potassium and argon actually is, so how can I, how can I challenge this? But I'm going to kind of make it, break it down just very simply. First of all, I have to find a mineral, and then I have to make some sort of assumption. I don't know how fast the rate is, but I can calculate it, right? But I don't know if something has affected the rate to speed it up. Because we have observed in science that the rates can speed up. They are not constant. And so they predict or they assume that the rate is constant. Then they make a measurement and then they say, well, this rock is four point something billion years old. 
But that is not accurate. That is an assumption. You have to make an assumption and then you can make your calculation based on the assumption. A good example of this is how many of you would like me to assign you an age based on your gray hair? No? Oh, I've got one volunteer and oh, you're bald. That doesn't count. <laughs> but nobody, nobody wants me to give them or assign them an age based on the ratio of gray hair to natural color hair. I know I don't have any gray yet. Actually, it's a funny story. When I was in college, I met a guy. He was really young, younger than I was. And by the end of the four years, he was absolutely gray. Just all the stuff. So why do you, do you think that's accurate? If I, if I assign you an age, maybe 10 years per gray hair? Huh? <laughs> no, you don't think that's accurate. Why not? Because there are many things that can influence the gray hair process. It's not just age. We know that stress can cause gray hair, right? Some of us are under a lot of stress and it starts to gray a little faster. We know that heredity can also play a big role. Some of us have, we look at our parents and say, oh no, you gray so quickly. <laughs> that means I'm coming up soon. But, and we, we may maybe even diet affects it. We don't know. But that's about the same kind of level it is. It's the potassium argon or this radiometric dating, you have to make an assumption. If I were to calculate your age based on gray hairs, I would have to make an assumption that, okay, you didn't undergo any stress and that everybody's genetics is exactly the same. But that's not true. That's not true. So we find that that method is not so reliable, but this is the gold standard method. But this is what it is. It's making an assumption. But assumptions are not the only thing that we are left with when we talk about this. We are also, also left with a paradox. And I will give you a really good example of that. This is found in the New York Times. This was actually on um, the origin of the eyeball. This was uh, put in the New York Times in 2010. And I want you to read the statement with me. You don't have to read that loud. I'll read it. Um, but I just want you to think about it and kind of mull it over and see whether or not it makes sense to you. Key features of the natural world have been honed by evolution to the highest possible peak of performance. Key features of the natural world have been honed by evolution to the highest possible peaks of performance. Now, not only is this an assumption, because none of us have ever seen evolution take place, but not only is this an assumption, but it's also a paradox. How? How is it a paradox? Well, in order for these key features of life to have been honed, life must have already been happening. And, however, life's key features couldn't have already been happening unless they were already honed. Do you understand? The key features could not have been honed unless life had already existed. But the key features could not have existed unless life had already been honed. Amen. Amen. So we find this paradox and it is printed and people are like, well, I don't really understand it. And we trade our conscience for consensus because this is, this is the standard. But it's a paradox and evolution cannot solve this paradox. Only God can. Amen. Only God can. God can solve this paradox. It is interesting. And it's not just that. But also, evolution does not abide by the laws of thermodynamics. And I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the laws of thermodynamics. They're very, very, very interesting. And this is also the gold standard of science. This is the first law of thermodynamics. Energy can be neither created nor destroyed. So what it is saying is that there is no, side of, there is no such thing as evolution. There is no such thing as creation of energy. This is the conservation of energy. Therefore, the power generation processes and energy sources actually involve conversion of energy from one form to another, rather than creation of energy from nothing. But this, how can these two correlate? So the first law stating that in all real processes, the total quantity of matter and energy stay, con stay constant 
even though its form changes. I would say this in biology, that no matter the dog, it is still a dog. From a chihuahua to a rottweiler, it is a dog, right? It comes in varied varieties, but does it change into a horse? No, it cannot, because it varies in its form, but it stays, it stays what it is. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. And as you can kind of see, that this does not correlate with evolution, although it's part of science. This is the second law. Whoops, I went back. No, I went back further. There we go. In all energy exchanges, if no energy enters or leaves the system, the potential energy of the state will always be less than that of the initial state. This is also commonly referred to as entropy. So what the second law is stating is that the quality of any system, its usefulness, decreases or increases over time? Decreases. Decreases, absolutely. As you get older, do you become younger and younger and younger? No. no. I wish, right? You become older. Things deteriorate. Things grow old. Mutations. Do they cause good stuff or bad stuff? Bad stuff. Actually, it feels like the cosmos is heading to some sort of death, doesn't it? Things do not get better. Things are getting worse. Diseases are more prevalent. Things are happening. So the second law of thermodynamics says that we are not going up. We are not evolving into some higher sphere. We are actually moving down. We are actually moving down. So these are very, very basic, basic, basic laws of science. But what is the point behind all of this? Is it really, is it really about science? My opinion is that it is not. Because I have, I actually read the Origins book by Darwin, and I get the sense, if you read it, I invite you to read it, it's very interesting. He actually capitalizes or personifies nature. He makes it a pronoun. He actually treats it as if it is a person. And it's interesting because if I were to remove the nature word and put God in it, I would find that it's, it feels like a malicious book. And what do we know? What is it when we cannot observe something but we believe that it happens? Faith. Evolution, we cannot observe, but they believe that it happens. It becomes a religion. It is a theology. And Paul, Paul was the one that kind of set the tone and said, this is, this is what's happening. He is the one that talks about this. And it's so interesting what he said. So I invite you guys to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to find that Paul speaks very, very clearly on this and that it is deeper than science. It is a religion. It is a religion. And there is some sort of result or some sort of effect from this religion. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen? Amen. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So what are they suppressing? The truth. The truth is being suppressed. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, did they know God? Yes. They did not glorify him as God. We will, we will put somebody else's name in here. It is not God who is doing all this. Nor were thankful, but became futile, and their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. 
I want to pause right there, and I hope you guys remember this. This is very important. I like another version that says, immortal God, mortal man. So just remember that. Immortal God, mortal man. Immortal God, mortal man. They kind of, Paul is saying they kind of switch places here. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, to exchange the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It's very interesting. So Paul says, here is no belief in God, and then somehow we got to all sorts of wickedness. So where is the step? How did we get from, I don't believe it to God, I don't believe in God, to every kind of evil? How? How did we get there? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen an atheist protest against homosexuality? No. Why? Why? Because if we weren't created, if we have just evolved, there is no natural or unnatural way to do anything. You can do whatever you want. There is no moral obligations. Whatever you wish, you can do. But we know that there are laws. The universe is held up by laws. We, I mean, the law of gravity is one of them. The law of gravity works if I jump off the stage or if I jump off the building, right? There are laws that govern the system. And this is some sort of rebellion and bucking the system and saying, no, no, I'm not going to do it. So how did we get there? Well, Paul gave us a clue. He said in verse 23 that they changed the, the glory of the immortal God to mortal man. So how did we get there? How, did we, how does that switch places? Well, let's connect Paul's thoughts. If there is no right or wrong, there is no sin, Correct. If there is no sin, there are no wages to sin. So what is the wages of sin? Death. If there is no death, then you are immortal. If you are immortal, then who are you? You are God. You are God. If, you, if there is no sin, there is no death. If there is no death, you are immortal. If you are immortal, you are God. Does that sound familiar? Then the serpent said to Eve, you will not surely die, Eve. You won't die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. You will be God. You don't need to follow the rules. There are no laws that can bind you. You can do whatever you want. The very, very first lie ever told. You can be God. You don't need God. God doesn't want any competition around, right? So we find this, and Paul is telling us, look, look, this is what's happening. Don't fall prey to us. But some might say, hey, April, Adam and Eve were immortal. Were they, though? No. Their immortal existence depended on what? The tree. The tree of knowledge. No, not the tree of knowledge. The tree of life, right? And that's to give us a lesson that our existence is not reliant on ourselves, right? It's reliant on God's provision for us. Right? I think he did that on purpose. I think he could have made them so that they could have just kept living. But he didn't. And that's why the angel barred the tree so that they couldn't be immortal sinners. Right? Right. So, evolution says you are God. So that's the first way, the very first way, to just wipe out God. There is no God. It's deeper than science. It is deeper than science. 
It goes way deeper. And Paul says this, that, look, this is a religion in itself. If you believe that there is no God, then all of these things will follow. But what about the Christians? What about the Christians? How does he get them? How does he get us? By challenging the historical validity of Genesis. That's how he gets us. It used to be about 150 years ago that Christians were kind of removed from the world, correct? And they stood firm on biblical truth, but that is changing very, very quickly today. Very, very quickly. And it started in Genesis. And it just wasn't the church members that were kind of getting a hint. It was somebody, a New Testament author, like I said, there was two. There's a New Testament author that actually tells us, hey, this is going to happen. And we can say, well, this isn't as serious, right? There's a lot of Christians that still claim to believe. Well, I will let you decide that for yourself. This is a quote in Education, um, not the book by Ellen White, but another book. The 123-year history of creationism clearly shows itself to be overwhelmingly rejected by the majority of Christian denominations and scientists of all faiths. It's a lot serious than what we had initially imagined it would be. So where is the prediction? God has provided provision for us to understand that this would happen. And we find that in 2 Peter. So 2 Peter... 2 Peter, starting, 2 Peter, verse, no, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3, starting with verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget. What are they forgetting? That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by which the word that that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So, what two things are being doubted here? Creation week and the flood. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are kind of being tossed around and people are saying, Christians are saying, I don't know if I buy into this. I don't know if this is real or if it's true or not. But maybe, maybe God kind of every day represented a million years or a billion years. So that's kind of the ongoing theory in creation week that God created the world, but he did it in billions and billions of years. But we know from the scripture reading in Psalms, you don't have to turn there, in Psalms 33, that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made for he spake and it took some time. No, it was done. He commanded and he got the ball rolling. It stood fast. God didn't take time to make it. It was just instantly. And people say, well, this is so hard for us to believe. And it's hard for us to believe the flood. How could there have been that many people on the earth? Was it really a cataclysm? Was it really a worldwide flood? Well, let me ask you, if God gave your grandparents the command to be fruitful and multiply, and the world was lush and beautiful and green, and you lived about 900 years, how many generations of children do you think that you could have had? (laughs) A lot. So we know that there was many, 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 many people. This wasn't some local tsunami. This was a worldwide flood. The word of God doesn't lie. And God doesn't lie. And when, you, when people doubt Genesis, not only are they doubting the Bible, but they're doubting Jesus. Jesus quotes or refers to Genesis chapters 1 through 11 at least 15 times. In fact, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. 
Well, Peter just told us that if they doubt the creation and they doubt the flood, they're going to doubt the second coming. And not only that, every New Testament author quotes or refers to Genesis chapters 1 through 11 at least once. The plan of salvation was implemented in the first chapter. So we have to trust it. We have to trust it. This is amazing. This is Surtsey, an island off the coast of Iceland. How many of you guys have ever heard of Surtsey? None? Well, a few of you. Surtsey is so incredible because, look at that. First of all, some of the rocks from Surtsey were taken and were given to be tested for radiometric dating like I showed you, potassium argon. It was shown that it was tens of thousands of years old. This island took four years to become an island. It was a volcano in 1963. It stopped in 1967. And this is 1964. Incredible, correct? Look at that. There is grass. There are flowers. There are puffins making their home there. This has become, and it's incredible. And I actually want to read a quote. I, don't, I didn't write it down because it was too long, but I have it on my phone. This was written by the official Icelandic geologist, an Icelander who has studied geology and geomorphology at foreign universities, is later taught by experience in his own homeland that the time scale he had been trained to attach to geological development is misleading when assessments are made of the forces constructive and destructive which have molded that are still molding the face of Iceland. What elsewhere may take thousands of years may be accomplished here in one century. All the same, he is amazed whenever he comes to Surtsey, because the same development may take a few weeks or even a day here. On Surtsey, only a few months suffice for a landscape to be created, which was so varied and so mature that it was almost beyond belief. During the summer of 1964 and the following winter, we not only had a lava dome with a glowing lava lake and the summit crater, and red-hot lava flows rushing down the slopes, increasing the height of the dome and transforming the configuration of the island from one day to another. Here we could also see wide sandy beaches and precipitous crags lashed by the breakers of the sea. There were cliffs, gravel banks, lagoons. There were hollows, glens, and soft undulating land. There were fractures and false scarps, channels and screes. You might come to the beach covered with flowing lava on its way to the sea with white balls of smoke rising up in the air. Three, three weeks later, you might come back in the same place and be literally confounded by what met your eye. Hmm. It's amazing. And they say that it couldn't have been done in a week. It couldn't have been done. Ellen White says this. It is one of Satan's devices to lead the people to accept the fables of infidelity, for he can thus obscure the law of God itself, very plain, and embolden men to rebel against the divine government. There is a constant effort made to explain the work of creation as a result of natural causes. Such and human reasoning is accepted even by professed Christians in opposition to plain scripture facts. There are many who oppose the investigation of the prophecies, especially those of Daniel and Revelation, declaring them to be so obscure that we cannot understand them. Yet, these very persons eagerly receive the suppositions of geologists in contradiction of the Mosaic record. But if that which God has revealed is so difficult to understand, how inconsistent it is to accept mere suppositions in regard to that which he has not revealed. I invite you later on to read the meditation on the back. It's very, very powerful what she talks about, the literal week. This actually came from Patriarchs and Prophets, the literal week. It's amazing. Friends, God has given us so much evidence in his word and also in creation. We can look around. Like Paul said, we are without excuse. We can see that his clear, invisible attributes are everywhere. We need to encourage our friends, encourage our fellow brothers and sisters in the faith to trust God. Trust him because he will not fail and his promises are sure and his love endures forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for guiding and directing us. 
Thank you for creating us, and thank you for giving us the chance to see your work so marvelously created. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. Lord, please help us to trust and obey you. Help us to depend on you, and help us to remember that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that you have a plan for each and every one of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer. Amen.